Good morning, everyone. We're going to give folks a few minutes to join us. So we'll give everybody about 30, 40 seconds um, just to respect your time um, because it is a Saturday and it is beautiful outside. So I would want to get you out um, before, before 11 a.m. morning. If you're just joining us, we're going to give folks just a little bit before we get started. All right, I think I think we're good. We're going to go ahead and get started. Welcome to today's class, um, Small Space Gardening. And just go over a few uh, housekeeping um, things for Zoom. Today's webinar uh, will last about 45 minutes with 15 minutes of Q&A. Um, and the, there's a question uh, box if you can enter your questions that you have for the end in there. Um, and if you want to message me or Steve, you can do so with the chat box. box. Uh, SCV Water, so who we are, we're a full service regional water agency located in Santa Cruz um, Valley. We provide service to about 300,000 folks in the Valley. Um, this is a page that's kind of important if you're interested in some rebates or resources. Um, visit conserve.yourscvwater.com. And we also have landscape resources. We um, recently put together a new a top 100 SCV friendly plant guide. I highly recommend that if you're interested in um, adding new um, native and uh, drought friendly plants to your um, collection of plants. Um, we do also have the Water Smart Workshop. If you haven't taken advantage of this, I do recommend it. You do earn $20 on your water bill for completing it, and it helps you go through your home to identify and fix any leaks you may have. Another great program that we have is our Smart Irrigation Controller Rebate. You can get up to $150, um, and it lets you control um, your irrigation. This is great for when it rains, which luckily we've had lots of rain, um, but it it doesn't turn your sprinklers on if they're, let's say it rains Tuesday and the app knows it's raining, it won't turn your sprinklers on. So I highly recommend that you do, you could get up to $150 back to that. We also have a, our landscape replacement program. Um, so if you're looking to switch to a more sustainable landscaping, this is a great option um, and there's still funds available for it. We also have our help program. This is to help uh, if you, you're not there yet and you don't wanna rip your lawn out, but you do wanna become a little more um, water, water wise, you can upgrade your irrigation to drip irrigation or HE nozzles, um, high efficiency nozzles and um, install like a pressure regulation. Um, you can get up to $750 for that. So, we're on Zoom. Um, if you have any, if you want a copy of the presentation, just email me. I'll also drop all this information in the chat so you can quickly um, link to them. And you can always find us on the web and connect with us, our website. Um, and then we also have, uh, we're on social media. And this class will be posted on YouTube and on our website. And please join us for our next class. It's also going to be virtual. It's called Cap It or Convert It, Better Landscape Irrigation Practices. Uh, we'll go over some of those help programs as well during that um, workshop. So that'll be on May 6th at 9 a.m. So I'm gonna pass over the presentation to Steve who will actually be um, instructing today's class. Okay, I need to be able to share the screen. There we go. There we go. I think we're ready to go. Thank you, Laura. And welcome everybody to Small Space Gardens. And we're, you know, really looking for those of you who have those smaller patio areas, you live in condos or just small space gardens that you're looking to address and landscape properly. Myself, uh, I graduated uh, from Mount San Antonio College and I Spent some years working at Descanso Gardens and Huntington Botanical Gardens. I've actually been teaching at Mount San Antonio College now for the last 19 years. 
And I've been a master gardener since 1996 in the Southern California area. So uh, let's get going here. So we're looking at our small garden space and um, we want to um, take a look at how large that is. And it may be that you actually have a, a garden, but you have small areas in your garden. We'll call these garden rooms that we're looking to address and perhaps to landscape those as well. So we're gonna talk about the space, design, materials that we use, themes, and then hard, hardscape and softscapes. So good design. Um, I don't, wouldn't necessarily call this good design, but let's look at the factors that we're, we're going to talk about today. We're talking about the functionability, how we're going to use this space and um, having a theme that we're going to carry through this area and group things together, coordinate our colors, have nice details, using attractive materials and keeping it simple. Now, I'd say that this here incorporates a lot of those factors but simple and good design, probably not. Let's go ahead and look forward here. So how are we using this space? Are you using this space for outdoor entertaining? Are you using it to grow an edible garden? Are you using it for uh, children, for pets? So you need to identify how you're using the space. Then that will help you identify how you want to actually landscape it. So uh, we can choose, sorry, I'm having problems advancing my slides here. There we go. Garden themes. Ah, it's doing a mind of its own. So if we can determine uh, what style that we want to incorporate into this design, we'll look at some of those in just a moment. This will help us then determine the choice of plants, uh, softscape, your materials, your hardscape and um, the design that you're actually going to incorporate throughout that area. So this can in include, of course, structures that are built, furniture, containers for the plants, and accessories for that area to, to brighten it up. So here's an example here. Sorry, again. Contemporary. Uh, a contemporary garden is a modern one. We have these geometric shapes. We have hard linear lines, bold plants that are maybe new and uh, incorporate bold foliage in their colors, in their form, uh, something that's gonna be very dynamic and contemporary and, and modern. So as you can see here, we've got the geometric pathways that leading to areas. And this is a, a smaller space here, maybe larger than you have in a, in a condo. But uh, again, we're looking at small spaces in the outdoor area of the garden as well. Cottage gardens. Cottage gardens will have meandering paths that lead you to a destination that's unknown around that corner with uh, mixed materials that are very loose and flowery, uh, inviting. Um, it's going to be interesting in its color dynamics and the type of materials that are used in the pathways. Um, will hopefully be ones that will allow water to percolate through the site. As you can see here, we've got that going on with gravel and so on. So um, cottage gardens are, are fun. The flowers will, um, throughout the year, we can have different bloom cycles. So there's always some color going on. It can be very inviting to wildlife with this type of flowering garden, birds, bees, and butterflies. So cottage gardens are always an exciting thing to incorporate into your design. So um, California Cottage, of course, um, we're looking then, we have these an outdoor space that's um, a little bit larger. And again, we've got this gravel pathway, uh, outdoor rooms, I mentioned that earlier. So <clears throat> this came about, Sunset Magazine kind of talked about this idea uh, 20 years ago where we have areas in our garden destinations and each one of these destinations can in itself be a design a design element. And they may, they may be similar, they may be very different um, that are going to invite you to this place around that corner to see something new. Um, we can incorporate you know, older things, vintage items. We can incorporate whimsical decor in the garden. 
garden art is always a fun thing to have in our garden and to search and hunt for those in your, your shopping trips and bring those home and add those to your design. If you can see the pathways, um, instead of with the contemporary garden, they're very straight and linear. We have very meandering uh, curved lines that are very inviting. You may also have furniture here, places to sit throughout the garden that you can sit and enjoy the wildlife that you're inviting as well. Do you notice lots of colors, I said, and throughout the year, we'll have different bloom cycles that happen. There's always some interest in the garden. Mediterranean, well, we are a Mediterranean climate, although uh, many would say that this is a desert. Technically, we are not a desert climate. We are Mediterranean. And this year, with all the rain that we've had, of course, uh, things should be bursting out. But this Mediterranean design incorporates those aspects that, that come from the Mediterranean region, things like um, terracotta, um, aged wood and stone, earth tones. You can see this wrought iron here. So things that are going to have you know, vibrant colors, they're going to have interesting structures. And again, we have lots of color with our plantings. So Mediterranean design fitting into our Mediterranean climate, incorporating those ideas from the Mediterranean region in Europe. So uh, next, <clears throat> we, I'm sorry, uh, continuing that Mediterranean here, you can see such elements that we would incorporate like covered patios, uh, outdoor dining spaces. These are aspects that of course in that Mediterranean lifestyle that we would find over in Europe and we wanna bring that here to our own backyards. Uh, it may be that you have uh, an outdoor oven, a pizza oven perhaps. Uh, people are very popular with those nowadays, incorporating those into our outdoor designs. So moving on to another design element here. <clears throat> tropical or Asian, um, where we're going to see uh, other factors here, um, you know, distinct foliage that fits into the Asian um, landscaping. And uh, there's uh, the palette of plants that come from Asia is tremendous. Many, many plants that we utilize in our garden space here. In fact, in the Southern California region, um, Asian landscaping was very popular back in the the 50s and has continued ever since. So a very green palette, um, lots of, of green flowing plant materials, incorporating even bamboo. Now remember that you have um, creeping bamboo or you have bamboo that uh, does not creep. And it's very important for you to choose the non-creeping type because otherwise it, it can be very invasive and take over your garden. So always choose the clumping bamboos for your garden. Um, water, incorporating water features. Um, it may be that you have a, um, a small stream area. Um, notice that we have, you know, clean lines uh, that are simple, but we incorporate, of course, a lot of distinct foliage and plant materials as well. So here's an example where we've uh, in, made the outdoor space appear to be larger. This is a mirror back here, actually. So in this patio space, we've incorporated a mirror that gives the illusion that the space is bigger than it is. And um, it makes for um, you know, a, a larger appearance uh, to your eye, your mind's eye. So creating that space, um, just simply in a patio, we can also use potted plants are gonna be part of this landscaping in this, in this patio area to green it up, make it more interesting, make it more inviting to us as well. So here's an example of a small space where it was unused, um, rather unattractive. So they decided to take this and make some changes. And as you can see here, we've been added some, some changes in the, in the brick. I'm gonna go back again, you can see here, we've added some distinct ornamentation to the brick area in here. <clears throat> We've added some wonderful plants. We have a feature here that, uh, again, adding those little touches like this, some potted or some container gardens as well. 
Now, this could be utilizing ornamental plants. You could also introduce some edible plants in your containers in the small space here as well. Now, I'm always of the inclination that um, if we're watering plants, it's nice to have some of those edible plants that we can actually reap the benefits from as well. So a hardscape in small gardens, um, you know, we want to incorporate and make that a useful place in here. It looks like a, maybe a little side patio spot that could be your, your morning cup of coffee, your evening cocktail, and uh, having a privacy here with uh, fencing, uh, interesting plant material, a seating space. So we've incorporated hardscape into our area here to make it a useful spot for us and dynamic um, foliage plant materials, as you can see as well. Now think about how you want to use your garden. Think about um, sun and shade in these areas so that you can use it at a time of day that you want to. Uh, if you have blazing sun in the afternoon, evening, this wouldn't be a good spot. But if you have the morning shade and a nice spot that you can enjoy that cup of coffee. So um, uh, map out your activities in your garden, determine where the sun shines at what time of day and how are you going to use these spaces comfortably. So pathways are always something that, that uh, again, lead us to a destination. And we can um, use straight lines, as we said, in very modern, or we can use these curving lines, which to me are a much more interesting, guide you to a place that uh, may be a hidden spot around a corner. And it's always very inviting. Notice the different uses of materials here. And there's um, many that we can use. Of course, nowadays, we're trying to incorporate uh, materials that will allow water to percolate on site rather than running off. So gravel, uh, flagstone over here in this bottom right or, or would be useful that allowing the water to percolate through in this patio area. <clears throat> Other areas here where we, we're using a pathway, but around it, we're surrounded it with mulch. So these mulch areas, of course, will allow that water to stay on site. This is a very important aspect nowadays in our landscaping is keeping your water on site and preventing it from running down the gutter and off to the ocean, potentially carrying with it all kinds of potential um, uh, fungicides and fertilizers and pesticides and pest, pet waste. So keep water on site. But again, notice the different types of materials here. Um, uh, stepping stones walking through a planted area, uh, surrounded by mulch again. Here we have... Um, steps leading up to an unknown site around the corner. So think of these, think of using organic natural things that uh, look very natural. And of course, plantings along the way here, adding a lot of color as well. So container gardening, as I mentioned before, uh, utilizing that patio space uh, for containers. Uh, many times we don't have a lawn area that we can actually plant into we only have the ability to use containers. So we can use unusual things, reuse items that uh, are novel and interesting and add interest to the site. Um, here's an old wheelbarrow that has been converted into a planting area. Um, foliage really matters. And so uh, in your containers, first of all, uh, in container gardening, it's always a good idea to place those in odd numbers, ones, threes, fives, and using a variety of containers that complement each other, yet have variety as well, makes it more interesting than if everything is the same. And the plant materials themselves, notice here we have some strap-like material that's very colorful and interesting in itself. Uh, traditional, we can use traditional type containers and uh, plant materials. Of course, nowadays, there are all kinds of new plant introductions. I just attended a new plant introductions in Santa Barbara where the growers are introducing the new plants to the nurserymen to purchase to have for sale in the nursery the following year. So I was surprised at these new plants that are coming out they're actually inventing new names or crossbreeding and coming up with new names. There's some beautiful things down the line. So um, address these, use them. 
here's a, a non-traditional type of um, <clears throat> plant materials and that that adage of thrillers, fillers, and spillers. So the thrillers are going to be the top grassy-like material. The fillers are the material that fills in around it. The spillers are the things that overflow over the side of the container. So we incorporate those three concepts into our containers, thrilling, spilling, and spilling. And there's a sundry of uh, plant materials out there nowadays where we can um, have colors that work together, or in some cases that um, opposites also will work, opposite colors on the color wheel. So we can go both directions. Containers can be of all different kinds. Uh, reclaimed materials, of course, are always great because uh, reusing things in today's world, we're trying to, to be more sustainable. So reclaiming and reusing things, using bold shapes. Um, here's a large steel pipe that's you know kind of rusty, so it has a rustic look to it. Um, conduit, rebar, over on the right here. Um, these originally were made out of metal. Nowadays, we have fiberglass containers which are great because they're gonna be a little bit cooler than a steel metal container. Think of that in your garden in the summer heat. Uh, you know, a steel container in the full sun is gonna get very hot. The soil in there is gonna heat up. The roots of the plant might not be real happy. So placement of these would be important so that you're not gonna incorporate that extra heat into the root zone. Again, reclaimed materials on the left. Somebody has uh, taken, uh, well, a barbecue that maybe they decided not to use as a barbecue, but instead to use as a novel planter, and they have done such here. And they have other planters in the area as well that they're incorporating containers of all different kinds in this garden space. On the right, um, you may have heard what's called a keyhole garden. This is kind of a uh, takeoff of that, where you have seating around the edges here, which is nice for activities where folks can sit around the edges, but also utilizing the space here for both uh, ornamental and edible plantings. So space would be your only limitation on building something this large, but it can be done on a smaller scale in a smaller patio area as well. So irrigation is always important uh, in this container garden that you have. Yes, you can go out there every day and water, or you could set it up on a drip irrigation system that's automated with a time clock um, and even have sensors on there that would sense when it needs to turn the water off and on. But if you're watering by hand, you can always check the moisture with your finger. And uh, when it's dry at one inches in depth would be the time to water again. And note that you know even on an automatic system, the timing needs to be changed seasonally because obviously we had rain this winter and uh, the system should have been shut down. And then now that we're getting into the hotter weather of spring and summer, we're going to need to uh, adjust that system accordingly. And as we get into the hotter part of midsummer, you know, June, July, August, we certainly will have to apply a little bit more irrigation. So be consistent with your watering, especially if you're watering by hand. You know, <clears throat> hand watering is the best way to water the garden. Uh, because you're going to water each plant according to their needs. But the problem is, is that you have to make sure you get out there and do it on a regular basis. That's where automating is always great, especially if you take vacations and travel at all, then you know that your system is going to be taking care of your plants will be watered. So if you have space, even in a small garden, raised beds are a great way to go, particularly if you have soil that is difficult to deal with. So let's talk just briefly about the soils in Southern California. Uh, I find that in um, the Santa Clarita region, you have some areas where you have heavy clay, but then some of you may have that well-drained, sandy, gravelly type of soil. So the folks that have the heavy clay soil, raised beds are definitely an adage, a great way to go. With the well-drained soil, it's not as important um, because that is our biggest problem many times with our soils is that if it doesn't drain well, the roots of the plants are too wet. Um, so uh, determine your soil type. If you have well-drained soil or do you have a heavy clay soil, raised beds are wonderful. 
also because as we get older, myself included, um, working up instead of reaching down to the ground is a little bit easier as well. And notice we can have some real design in this as well. We do want to make sure that there's space between the, the raised bed pathways, and that should be a minimum of three foot space to get a wheelbarrow between there and do your work that you need to do in that garden. And again, we can incorporate ornamental plants as well as edible plants into the raised beds. Um, we could have an automated irrigation system here. I like to use what's called inline drip, which will uh, address the entire surface of the soil areas and it will be uh, entirely watered, not just hit and miss uh, a little bit here and there, but the entire area will be irrigated. So inline drip irrigation. Here we've used block and, uh, you know, the only problem with block here in Southern California is that our soils are very alkaline and this block being made out of um, uh, cement is very alkaline in itself. So that means that just inside of your bed area, the soil might have an increase of alkalinity. So keep that in mind. You might wanna plant a little bit away from the edge here to reduce that. Plants really prefer soil that is slightly acidic. And here again in Southern California, our soils are very alkaline. Um, as far as trying to change the pH in your soil, that's not the easiest thing to do, but uh, compost will help. There's also products like soil sulfur that can be used where we test the soil first and then we determine the pH and then we make changes based upon that. So uh, blocks can be used and uh, real easy to set up and to move around to different spots in the garden. No, I like to um, add or incorporate um, edibles in my garden, as I mentioned already, and a orchard area. And there are dwarf fruit trees that we can utilize that will fit into a smaller space. Some can even be grown in containers, and um, they, of course, need to be 18 inches or larger. Um, we can choose such things as citrus do very well in Southern California and can handle our climatic changes typically. Uh, dwarf varieties in a container of citrus should be grown in that container for maybe four or five years. And then we should lay that container on the side, maybe pull that plant out, trim the roots a bit, add a little bit more soil and replant it, uh, especially for citrus. Now on your deciduous fruit trees, um, such as peaches, plums, nectarines, apples. Again, a large container and low chill varieties of the deciduous fruit trees. Although you do have cool, pretty cold weather during your winters in the Santa Clarita area, uh, fruit trees, um, we, we like to choose fruit trees that have maybe a 250 hour or less of chilling requirements. You can go to a website, davewilson.com, and you can find out that information there about chilling hours, about different required hours for different types of trees, and then choices that you can make at your local nursery and incorporate those into that patio area. So in containers or in the ground, uh, backyard orchards are wonderful, again, because you're, you're watering your, and fertilizing your plants and actually producing food that you can eat. And nowadays, uh, of course, we've had a wet winter and lots of rain. The reservoirs are filling. But in reality, remember that we live in this climatic region where um, Mediterranean climate, we could have wet years, we can have dry years. And the water that we're, we're gathering now um, will be used and hopefully replenished, but there's no guarantees. So incorporating ways to use less water in your garden are always helpful. Drip irrigation, um, containers that you're controlling the, the water on those areas and not just letting water flow off down the gutter. And that's what we're trying to um, have you appreciate as well. So at that Dave Wilson website, you'll find information about multiple planting of trees in one hole. And we can actually plant two, three, or four trees together that will enable us to increase the, um, the productivity and uh, what we're going to actually produce to eat in the end. So these trees should be planted about 18 inches apart within that whole area and the trees need to be related to each other. 
In other words, you would not plant an apple and an orange. You could plant different varieties of apples or different varieties of peaches. For example, early season ripening peach, mid season ripening, and late season ripening are planted in the same hole and you'll have peaches then throughout the entire season. Always, of course, choosing those low chill varieties. And this, of course, will also help with pollination. There are some trees that need to have pollinizers, fruit trees, that need to have a pollinizer in order to be productive. And so we can plant the pollinizer right with this group. So in a backyard that you may have had one fruit tree planted every 10 feet, instead, you can have a group of two, three, or four planted. And then uh, eight to 10 feet away, you can have another group of trees planted. And you've exponentially increase the number of trees that you have in your garden and the amount of food that you produce. And the water is gonna be just about the same that you're applying for one as you would for four. So uh, you're really maximizing the use of your water as well. So uh, when we do plant a tree, we always want to incorporate a basin around that tree so that when we water that newly planted tree in its first year of transplant, the roots are well addressed. The roots are well watered and we can establish a, a good strong root system on that tree. So in containers, as I mentioned, a blueberry on the left, a citrus on the right, making sure the container is large enough. Notice the sides of the container are slanted outward. They're not straight up and down. They're not pointed toward the center, but they're um, reaching outward. And this is important when it comes time to transplant that plant, that you can move, remove it from that pot. If the sides uh, are bending toward the center of the, um, the tree, then it's gonna be difficult to pull that plant out of that pot eventually. Now, also keep in mind that such things as blueberries really do need to have a pollinizer to be most productive. So choosing a large container, perhaps a half oak barrel and planting two blueberries in that same container, two different varieties, they will cross pollinate and give you better production. Uh, if not in the same container, then in two containers that are close by. And uh, then the pollination with the bees will then guarantee you'll have incre increased productivity. So let's take a look then at uh, some other examples of saving space in your garden, the measured garden and vertical gardening. So <clears throat> square foot gardening, uh, this is a concept that's been around for a few years. Mel Bartholomew is the one who really marketed this. Uh, Mel passed away a couple of years ago, but square foot gardening was his uh, idea to maximize your growing efficiency in your, in your garden space by actually cordoning off your, your, it could be a raised bed or in-ground bed into one foot sections. In each of those one foot squares, you plant a plant, seasonally appropriate. And that's an important thing to remember that we wanna plant the right plant for the right time of year. Uh, we're coming out of winter right now into spring, summer, where we're gonna be choosing our, our tomatoes, eggplants, peppers, and those type of plants. And we're leaving behind from winter and removing the broccolis and cauliflowers, the winter crops that we were growing. So we, we change our plants seasonally. We grow a plant in a square. When it has completed its cycle and performed for us, we remove that plant and replace it with another one. Another thing to always remember is to um, rotate your crops in your garden. And this is important because we don't wanna plant plants within the same family in the same spot for a three-year cycle. An example would be the Solanacea family. Um, tomatoes, eggplants, peppers, tomatillas, are all in this family, potatoes. We don't wanna plant any plants within that family in the same spot for three years. The reason being that plant diseases, plant pests, uh, soil-borne diseases can be a problem if we plant plants in the same family, they're likely to attack that plant within, within that period of three years. So we move the plants around within the squares or in your other garden efforts so that we um, rotate those plant families, it's very important. So you can find a list of plant families if you Google it. Uh, vegetable plant families, and this will help you do this. So this square foot gardening, again, is uh, very productive because you're really utilizing your space best 
and always having something grow year round within a spot. When one plant finishes up, you add some compost to that one area to add the nutrients back to the soil and you replant. And yes, you can have an automatic irrigation system. Here's what I would have incorporated as, as well, your inline drip. So here shows you utilizing a space, a little side garden here and the square foot gardening. And here's an example of how many plants you can plant within a square. Um, <clears throat> a little bit large, uh, one tomato plant. In fact, your tomato plant may take more than one square. You might wanna consider four squares for that tomato. But carrots, for example, we can plant 16 carrots in one square. Um, uh, peppers would be one plant. Um, lettuces would be four. Of course, we're moving out of the lettuce season right now. But uh, these numbers you'll find online. If you Google square foot gardening, you'll come up with all these plans for planting the number of plants to plant within a square and which season to plant them as well. So it's a lot of fun to really maximize your growing. Again, this can be not only edibles, but it can be utilizing uh, flowering plants as well or incorporating the two together. And remember, flowers are important to, to draw bees or other pollinators into your garden to help your vegetable garden be more productive. So vertical gardening, um, this is gardening up. And again, for that limited space, we can grow things upward. And here's an example of a beautiful succulent display where they have done just that. Um, we have in here these felt pockets, and I'll show you in a moment. These can be purchased uh, commercially, these felt pockets to plant into. And there's other ways as well. Um, beautiful mix of succulents with lots of variety of color and forms and low water use. You know, the thing about succulents to remember is that they typically don't want to be grown in full sun. They really need to have part shade during the day. So a spot where you can give it uh, part sun, but also perhaps in the afternoon, the hottest part of the day, it would be more in a shaded situation. And this would also in, can incorporate an irrigation system uh, that would make it very efficient. They have some lighting in here. So at nighttime, they can enjoy this as well. So other examples of this vertical gardening, um, um, building or reusing something here with pockets and plants are planted directly into the pockets. There's soil there. The plants are planted. Uh, the watering could be an automated drip or watering by hand and then changing plants out seasonally. It's like you've got some strawberries and lettuces in here of different types. So it can be very productive in a very small space that is vertically grown. On the right, uh, a pallet, and we can convert a pallet into a vertical growing space as well. And using incorporating drip irrigation to make it very easy to take care of. Here we can utilize something as simple as the, these shoe trees that we can purchase at the dollar store, perhaps, and they may last for one season or two, where we can uh, put the soil right in these pockets and plant directly into them and set up an irrigation system or water by hand. It's kind of a novel approach, but it makes it fun and interesting, and people will certainly gasp, yet say, that's a good idea. I think I'll try it myself. So. Um, be inventive, uh, come up with new ways that you can utilize and reuse things. Perhaps you had this and you never used it otherwise. There's a great way to use it in the garden. But as I mentioned before, that we can actually purchase some of these professionally or commercially made felt pockets that come in modular sizes that will last and hold up for many years. And that's the advantage of the felt versus the shoe tree one is this will give you many years of use. So again, uh, a whole vertical wall can be built uh, with these felt pockets and planted irrigation system set up as well. Here's a tiered garden, and this one could be on wheels that it could be mobile and moved around uh, or just sit stationary where it's at. But it gives an interesting design concept here that you have the three sides and uh, tiered building upward. Um, just is an interesting small space planter that would work well for you in that smaller apartment type of um, or condo area and really maximizing your growing space. It's like they've got carrots and lettuces in here. 
And again, changing your plants out seasonally. So just containers themselves, and they have made tiers here by utilizing some platforms to plant, to, to set the pots on. And again, notice that it's a variety of containers, uh, always keeping in mind the odd number in placements, threes, fives, sevens, gives a better eye appeal, not only with containers, but when we plant plants in the garden and we're doing a large planting area, planting in odd numbers as well gives just a better eye appeal. So here we've got tiers. Uh, we've got a lot of color where we're a uh, color, red colored pot. We've got red colored flowers. So we're, we're tying things together. Uh, we're making a lot of fun, being very flexible. Again, changing out your plants seasonally. Uh, the flowering plants down here, of course, the marigolds would need to be changed out regularly. But there's lettuces growing in here. There's cactus here. So make it fun. Uh, make it very flexible. So growing up again in a smaller space, we can use supports of different kinds, either homemade ones with bamboo and, and tied together here, laced together for a support for your beans during the summertime, peas during the winter, uh, could be for squashes. Um, here we have an example of actually doing just that, growing a melon, a watermelon and a vertical planter, but we've given it some support. We built a, a sling, and this sling could be an old t-shirt or something that would support the weight of that fruit while and we tie this up on the support system and growing vertically instead of having a sprawling um, uh, either watermelon or cantaloupe garden or zucchini we can grow things upward on support systems so this is a novel way again to save space and and to grow in a smaller space garden Uh, here we've taken a, a chain link fence and planted uh, the grapes there and allowing the grape to just take over that fence. Of course, now grapes are going to go deciduous during the wintertime and then leaves are all going to die back. And then the following spring, the growth will reemerge again. And look at the abundance of grapes growing here. Uh, pretty phenomenal, actually. So we can use all kinds of ways to grow soil or soilless. Um, we have, um, you know, new methods now of, of doing this soilless gardening, uh, either in small containers um, that are self-watering or that can have drip irrigation systems that feed them. Uh, again, soil or soilless, um, depending on how you set this up. And uh, it's a lot of fun. And as you can see, it really does maximize space and uh, using very little resources to do such. Utilizing uh, supports like this in the garden are very attractive, but I might caution you that they might not be the most useful because if you're growing, for example, a bean up this, it's going to be difficult to get inside to do any harvesting. So I like supports that are more open that don't have such tight little spaces that are easier for you to actually get in and do the harvesting that you need to do so they're attractive but maybe not the most useful but again in a garden utilizing things like this um, to excuse me to um add interest and uh, what we're trying to do and uh, novelty and color and new form uh, just to make it more interesting for you and the public to, to observe. Espalier is another way to grow upward vertically. It could be both edibles or ornamentals. Um, and notice that this is growing flat against this brick wall surface. So we can purchase plants that are already trained in this espalier form and continue training it. We can train a plant ourselves um, by removing all the forward growing growth and simply training it to grow flat against the wall. And there are actually devices that we can get to attach this to the wall itself. And again, uh, if it's an edible garden, you're really maximizing the, the space and giving you something in return to eat. Uh, so uh, espalier is always fun. It's a lot more work. Uh, if you go to purchase a plant that is espaliered, of course, it's going to be more expensive 
than a plant that was grown normally because of all the work and training it. So in a garden space, um, even in a small garden, we can utilize the edges of the borders and develop a very attractive and colorful and inviting form there, utilizing plants that will uh, change their blooming cycles throughout the year. Now, this is not only important for you to enjoy looking at, but also for wildlife to provide resources for wildlife. Birds, bees, and butterflies need nectars, need pollen at different times of the year, and having a garden that blooms at different times will do just that for them. So keep in mind that we want to support our wildlife in our gardens as well. And um, having something that changes color throughout the year will be very interesting for you as well. So um, interplanting is um, where in that small space, we're going to, similar to the square foot gardening, as one plant finishes up, we're gonna change it to another. So we having some tools, especially in a smaller condo or patio area, you still need to have your little garden tools, your pruners and your uh, little rakes and your brooms to clean up that space. So developing a set of tools is gonna to be important for you. Um, Watering we talked about, utilizing drip irrigation is always a great way. Uh, feeding your plants or giving them nutrients occasionally on a scheduled program is important. Watching for pests in the garden and controlling those pests, uh, hopefully utilizing safe methods, fewer chemicals. And that's where uh, inviting, um, having plants that provide for beneficial insects in your garden the good insects will help control the bad insects. So having all these flowering plants will be a place for the good insects to come in and, and live and thrive and help you combat the bad guys. So interplanting is, is just this, where we have a site where we uh, can incorporate both edibles and ornamentals together. When one of your annual flowering plants completes its cycle, we can replace it with an edible. And seasonally, we're gonna change things out so you always have something going on and you're filling in these, these uh, spots and you're transplanting a plant rather than growing from seed is really best in these cases to transplant. But you know, growing plants from seed is a lot of fun and that's something you can do yourself. And then the plants that you do grow can be planted directly into your garden. And as I said, having a mixed planting with flowers and your edibles will help control pests by having a place for the beneficial insects to thrive. So <clears throat> irrigation, as we said, is really important. We wanna have that consistent moisture in, this, in the soil. We don't want it to go wet, dry, wet, dry. And that really is stressful on plants when we do that. Um, we don't want runoff. We wanna keep the water where it's at and keep it on site so it doesn't flow off of your site. Uh, we can utilize, as I said, drip irrigation, but we can be as simple as a soaker hose may work for you. Uh, always eliminating weeds and I don't know about your garden but right now the with all the winter rain that we have we have a lot of weeds growing get out there take care of those weeds before they flower and set seed and continue the cycle if you can get them out now this year you'll have fewer weeds next year um, so always um, make sure that the top one inch of your soil is moistened and then uh, water when necessary and during the summer months uh, if you have a sandy soil uh, on a well-established plant or tree, it may be every two to three weeks uh, on a heavier clay soil. It may be less often because it holds the water much better. The other thing that's very important to help reduce your water use is the use of mulch. And mulch can come in different forms. In an edible garden, uh, the use of, of uh, straw works very well. In an ornamental garden, we may want to use more uh, material that um, is going to be more attractive, but a two to three inch layer of mulch in the garden will help prevent weeds from growing. It'll help hold the water in the soil so you have to water less. So mulch, 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 and mulching maybe would be done at least once a year, uh, sometimes more often, so that we always have that two to three inch layer. Nutrients in the garden, as we said, your plants need um, food 
So uh, nitrogen is a water soluble nutrient that flushes through the soil. So that's one that we do need to replace every year. Our other three primary nutrients, phosphorus and potassium of those three, uh, they maintain their place in the garden and we don't need to add them as often. So testing your soil is really important. You can get a little home test to test for these three nutrients as well as your, um, uh, your whether you're uh, at alkaline or acid soil, your pH. And then you can determine whether you need to add fertilizer, how much to add, and how often to add it. Because too much can be just as detrimental as not enough. And of course, we don't want the extra fertilizer to run off into the gutters and into the oceans as well. So again, keeping the water on site. So if we fertilize before we plant in a planting area, like a raised bed area, when the, the newly planted plants are three to four inches tall, and then throughout the season, every three to four weeks. And it can be different forms. You may want to consider using, instead of uh, fertilizing as often, using a time-release fertilizer that will last through the entire season. This is a particularly useful in containers, uh, maybe a color bowl, and we can incorporate the time-release fertilizers and have that color bowl uh, fed for the entire spring through summer. And then, of course, fall would be time to, to redo that color bowl. So fertilizing is very important in your garden as well. And pest management, as I said, uh, utilizing plants, skipped ahead, utilizing plants that will uh, attract the beneficial insects that can help fight off the bad insects in your garden is what we call integrated pest management. Using the least harmful method of control, the least toxic pesticide in your garden as well is gonna be beneficial for you and for wildlife. Uh, using resistant plants that uh, are, aren't prone to diseases, like a tomato plant that has disease resistance, keeping your garden clean of debris, and again, in, in trying to encourage the natural predators into your garden. So with that, we've covered some, some points here that I think will be helpful to you in that small space garden, uh, containers, vertical gardening, uh, maximizing your growing space, square foot gardening, all of these aspects will be, be great for those small spaces. So if there's any questions, I'm, I'm open to answering those. So let's see in the chat area here, let me back up and take a look. There's some tips there for you. You might want to take a look at on a lawn replacement that you can click on, um, an upcoming schedule of the upcoming classes that are being offered. Um, I'm looking to see if there's any questions for you. Um, hard pruning of tomatoes, thoughts. Um, so by hard pruning, um, you know, we can, I don't know if you're speaking of hard pruning to encourage new growth. Um, you know, the problems with, with growing tomatoes in our hot climate here is that midsummer, our plants start to cook a little bit. What I like to do is actually, as I mentioned before, is providing some afternoon shade for your, even your tomato plant uh, or midsummer where we have that extreme heat, uh, providing shade for them part of the day will certainly extend your, your performance on that tomato plant. Um, as far as hard pruning, we can prune the tomatoes to encourage new growth. When we get dieback, we can prune them and get new growth and then continue our, our harvesting throughout the summer. There's also some tomatoes that can overwinter, particularly cherry tomatoes sometimes will live right on through a mild winter and come back in the springtime. And we can then do a little pruning on that spring plant and then encourage new growth and continue on through spring and summer in the second year. I don't know if that's what you're speaking of, but um, certainly we can do that. Uh, I didn't see anything else here in the chat. Let me see if there's anything. Ah, here we go. Oh, so you're speaking of um, hard pruning in the respect of growing your plant in with one or two liters versus in a cage. I personally like to cage my tomato plants because I find that that extra growth 
will also shade the fruit and protect it from sunburn. If you have a plant that is staked with just one or two liters, then you have more exposure. And in our hot climate, I'm finding that your, your uh, tomatoes are gonna get sunburned. So in a cage, it's a lot less work. You have the extra shading and the plants, the fruit does not burn, okay? Um, so as far as native plants in vertical gardening, boy, that's a tough call. Um, because, you know, native plants, we typically want them to grow in a situation where they are gonna receive the least amount of water. So we're not gonna give them an excess amount of water. So we wanna make sure that's happening. And uh, because we don't want excess growth on those native plants, we want them to, to grow less, require less pruning, require less watering along the way. Um, so I'm gonna have to, I would have to take a look and come up with a better list for planting vertically on those. I know offhand, I can't think of any good examples. Um, any other questions for the chat area? Or let's see, Q&A, let me click onto that and see what we have there. Ah, a question here on weed removal and Roundup. You know, Roundup is pretty controversial, uh, the potential for cancer and whether that is true or not, but there are lawsuits out there. I pretty much stopped using Roundup for that very reason. I don't want to take the risk. And uh, weeds, your annual weeds, your grassy type weeds typically can be simply uh, cut down to the soil surface, weed eated to the surface, but your perennial weeds that have a taproot, that taproot needs to be removed. Now, in those annual weeds, if we leave the roots in the ground on those and remove the top growth, we have a factor in the soil where there's a beneficial um, relationship between roots and plants and mycorrhizae in the soil. So roots in the soil can be very beneficial, but always remove the tap root on a perennial weed. Uh, here's uh, this person removed a, uh, Lori removed a pepper tree from your front yard two years ago, and you have a barren spot where it was, and you have shoots coming up. This is very common with the pepper trees. That's a tree that you should never plant in your garden uh, because it can become very invasive. And we get these uh, shoots that grow from the existing root system that's left in the garden. So you simply need to, as those sprout up, you need to clip them off at the soil line and prevent them from growing. And over time, uh, being that they can't produce any food through photosynthesis, because there's no leaves left, they will die back and the roots will die back. So it's not an easy task. The hint is do not plant a pepper tree in your garden to begin with. Um, so uh, would raised beds in a barren spot work well? Yes. Um, a raised bed would work very well for you in those areas, making sure that you've eliminated any growth that could grow up through those beds from that old tree. Um, again, I'm going to have to, on the vertical garden, native plants, I'd have to refer to, to a list for that. Uh, yes, this recording will be available later as, as a recorded session. Um, growing herbs in containers, basil. Um, so in a container, we like to use a potted soil mix. We don't use dirt that we dig up out of the garden. We use a bagged potting soil. And there's, there's all kinds of good brands out there. Um, typically, um, we're going to grow that basil in that container for one season. Next year, you'll want to add some additional soil to that. You'll find that the soil is going to shrink in your containers, and you'll need to add additional. Mix it in. Now, if you're growing a tomato in a container, it's recommended that you actually replace the entire soil every year because there's a potential for diseases that are carried by tomato plants. And so we were supposed to really replace that soil. But for smaller plants, we can simply add additional soil every year, and a, and a quality bagged potting soil will be great. Okay, let me see if there's anything else here. Okay, here we have on um, <clears throat> sunflowers. Um, my sunflowers are really long. They're not outside yet. Okay, so here's the deal. In starting plants from seed, 
we must make sure that they have plenty of light so they don't stretch. And if you're growing indoors, uh, I have a bottom heat that I provide to my little seed trays. And then I have light that I immediately provide to those plants because light coming through a window for a few hours is not enough. Uh, you need more. You could take those seeds that you've started indoors and put them outdoors in the sunlight every day. But we had periods of time here recently where we didn't have much sun. So using artificial light, and there's some new um, LED lights that can be used for that purpose that are very um, energy efficient as well. And they will tell you how far they should be placed from the lights or from the plants. Some lights want to be two to three inches from the plants. Some want to be 21 inches away, depending on the light fixture that you get, the light that you get. Um, always do that and your plants won't stretch and then you'll be able to plant them outdoors and they'll perform properly for you. Okay. Um, but yes, go ahead and plant them soon. Uh, we like the soil to warm up outdoors uh, before we do a lot of planting from seed directly in the garden. But transplants, it's to the point now, tomatoes can be transplanted. They can handle cool soil. But as we go forward, we want to wait for the soil to warm before we transplant our peppers and eggplants, for example. But uh, sunflowers, very soon, within maybe a couple of weeks, they could be transplanted in the garden. Okay. Any other questions? Well, I think we've covered many of the questions that you had, hopefully given you some ideas for your small space gardening, um, ways that you can grow vertically in containers uh, and be successful at that as well. With that said, Laura? Yeah, Steve, I actually wanna do make a plug for a new publication we recently published. It's called Garden Smarter. I'm gonna drop the link in there for you. Um, but there's actually a whole section on like gardening inside your home um, and vertical gardening. Um, and I highly recommend taking a look at that. I will be sending out a survey um, for today's um, session. And in it, I will make sure to include all these things and resources. I'm going to quickly just briefly share my screen um, so I can show you what that publication looks like because it's truly beautiful. Um, and here it is. So we have a page where um, we cover growing food and the knowledge on that, um, a native wildlife. It's beautiful. You can actually pick up a copy, a hard copy at like Green Thumb. Uh, salads. So this is the one page I'm talking about where you can uh, water wise tips for container gardening. Um, great publication. It, we just mm -hmm. launched this maybe two weeks ago, um, but I highly recommend it. It's available on our website and I dropped the link also. Um, so with that, I, I hope you are um, enjoying today's uh, class and now you can enjoy your day. Um, but that's it for me. I hope you can join us for our next um, class next month. So thank you, Steve. I appreciate all your knowledge. Um, it's you. always a pleasure to have you. See you next time. Have a great day, everybody.